Let's say you have a car. It's a basic, reliable, silver Toyota Corolla, five years old, um, nothing particularly special about it. Now, let's get a group of people together and ask them what this thing is. Well, that's a car, says Practical Mac, and everyone in the group nods their heads in agreement. Very well, I say, but what then is a car? A car is something that you drive around in, pipes up Practical Mac. It's a thing for driving. That's not what a car is, barks Maggie Mechanic. Really? I say, curious. Then what is a car? It's an engine apparatus with four tires and a steering wheel, plus whatever other amenities or gadgetry you want on there, Maggie Mechanic explains. Now hold up, Practical Mac says. Sure, those are parts of a car, but that's not what a car actually is. I could have all those parts lying around on my driveway, but if I can't drive the thing anywhere, then it's not a car. It's just an engine and some tires and a steering wheel. No, you've got it all wrong, Maggie Mechanic argues. You're saying a car is just a thing you drive places, but if that's true, then what's the difference between a car and a horse and buggy? or an elephant, or a boat, or a plane for that matter. I'll tell you what the difference is. It's that a car has certain parts, an engine, tires, a steering wheel, etc. Now wait just a minute, says Augie the abstract artist. I take issue with that definition. If a car is just the parts, then what about my most recent creation? And with a flourish, he suddenly unveils a giant metal assemblage sculpture, an engine, a steering wheel, and tires, but all welded together into something indescribable. I call it duress, he says proudly. His opinion doesn't count, Maggie Mechanic says dismissively. He thinks junk stuck together is art. It is too art, Augie the abstract artist shouts back. People, people, I say calmly. Let's stay on topic. What is a car? Augie, do you have an answer? Well, Augie begins thoughtfully, it seems to me that a car is something that mimics the underlying essence of car. What is that supposed to mean, Practical Mac asks, confused. Take this new sculpture of mine, for instance, Augie the Abstract Artist explains. It represents the essence of the general human experience of the emotional state of duress. I will have done my job as an artist insofar as I can mimic that essence in the sensible world. I must align these raw materials with that platonic form of duress, just as this Toyota Corolla mimics the essence of car. You got all that junk for five bucks from the junkyard off of Route 92, Maggie said, because you couldn't afford anything better. Truth on the outside lies on the inside, cried Augie indignantly, quoting Dostoevsky. All of you people know nothing at all, interrupted Fabio the physics major. <laughs> Sorry. Fabio the physics major. All this stuff about engines and use and philosophy is nonsense so long as you're asking about what the car really is at bottom beneath all these other incidental trappings. What a car really is is an amalgamation of atoms. There was a brief silence. That doesn't answer anything at all, Practical Mac exclaimed. If it's just an amalgamation of atoms, then one on Earth sets it apart from literally anything else in the universe. Uh, also, said Quinton, the quantum physics PhD, adjusting his glasses, there is quite a bit of argument over what atoms really are. The whole orbiting balls model is just that, a model. It's just a way for understanding the raw information we've gathered. We have no idea what atoms really, quote, look like. So which is it? I asked cordially. What is a car, people? What criterion is most correct for defining it? Is it just a matter of utility? Is it just a bunch of parts put together? Is it the manifestation of a platonic form? Is it a bunch of atoms? Or some other kind of quanta? Which of these interpretations gets closest to describing what the car really is? They all were stumped until 
Quinton, the quantum physics PhD, said, adjusting his glasses once more, well, it seems we need some kind of arbitrator, something we can reference authoritatively to say which of these perspectives is most correct. Everyone agreed that this was a capital idea until they all began suggesting different possible authorities. Practical Mac suggested they consult an official English dictionary. Maggie Mechanic suggested they view engineering schematics for the first true car. Augie was quite willing to teach everyone the true method of platonic dialectic leading up to a mystic vision of the forms and the good. Fabio, the physics major, held up a textbook from his class, and Quinton, the PhD, referenced his most recent experimental research. It seemed as though they were never going to get settled on what the car actually is. Derrida's philosophy could be understood as an answer to the long-standing question of what we mean when we use the word is. So Derrida, I think, saw this whole situation, this dialogue about the car, and framed it in now famous but, of course, misunderstood terms. He described the faith in a single language as being most able to answer the question, what is this? He saw that faith as logocentrism. So once again, logocentrism, that term, means the faith that one of the members of the previous dialogue is most correct, regardless of any and all context or circumstance. So this is what Derrida means in that one innocuous quote. It's a rather innocuous quote uh, from Of Grammatology that everybody makes a whole lot out of and which is consistently mistranslated as there is nothing outside the text. The original French, I can't pronounce it, but I'll just put it in to the description if you look below. I, I don't know why there's been so much trouble translating it. I suppose because the word uh, hors text is is difficult. It's a hyphenated word that Derrida is playing a little bit with. You could translate it as outside hyphen text, but that's just another word in the French for inset. So there is no inset. That's all Derrida is saying. So what's an inset? It's a page that is inserted into a book after the fact, usually because it is printed on a different sort of paper so that it can provide a photograph or a color map or an illustration, etc. My own copy, by the way, of Derrida's La Carte Postale, um, or the postcard, has just such an insert. It has the postcard that is referenced throughout the entire book, and I am certain that this was recommended by Derrida to the publisher as a continuing little joke. What's Derrida's point with that? It's that there is no Archimedean perch from which we might judge which single perspective is superior, that is, which is closer or most aligned with the truth and therefore most valuable as a perspective at all the other perspectives' direct expense. For the text that is our experience of the car, there is no inset which provides the definitive diagram or illustration of the car itself, which would prove one of those people right. Instead, we are left with a number of competing interpretations. Derrida asks, why should these interpretations compete? Isn't the car all of those things, and probably more? Now note something very important. Derrida hasn't said anywhere here that every interpretation you could possibly come up with is valid. Just because there is no inset doesn't mean that there is no text. If you want to provide an interpretation, then you, then you have to prove it is legitimate by referring to what is provided by the text. And if you want to say what the car is, then you have to refer to the text of the car provided to you. So all Derrida is pointing out is the fact that texts provide for more than one equally legitimate interpretation. They are more inclusive than we sometimes like to think because objects are far more complicated than a one-sentence description can circumscribe. We have to look things from multiple angles to really understand them. A car is a thing you can drive, like a horse and buggy, but it also has an engine, unlike a horse and buggy, but like a boat or an airplane. 
And it also has a certain ineffable carness to it, the shape of a car or the feel of a car, to which, which is socially recognized, and so on. It's not just one of those things, but all of those things. This is what Derrida calls difference. Every individual thing is what it is because it participates in a multitude of different legitimate interpretations of it, different overlapping categories, and it participates in all of them, yet commits fully to none of them. A car is both an amalgamation of atoms and an assemblage of parts, but it is also more than just those two things. It is not, however, a pile of rubber ducks or something stupid or ridiculous like that. Okay, <laughs> it's not completely random nonsense, unless you have very strange definitions that somehow make it so that that works in the text. That's the only way that it could be, quote, a pile of rubber ducks. But just using the colloquial tr translation, no, that's not there in the text. So what is the car? It is that which differs from everything that it is not. And thus, every attempt to say what it is is merely a deference of the meaning onto some other thing that it is only partially. It is merely to postpone the need to fully understand it by oversimplifying the issue by ignoring the loopholes in its definition. Derrida pits difference against logocentrism. Logocentrism is not, as is often said, an accusation against the Greek notion of logos or of a rational account. That's what logos means. Uh, it's not an accusation of that on the grounds that it has been made central at the expense of irrational accounts. I don't even know what an irrational account would be. The only thing I can think of is protests, shouting, threats, violence, manipulation, etc. For some reason, everybody seem I shouldn't say everybody, but people seem to think that he says logocentrism as though it's like, you stupid logos, you logical people rule the world and are at the center of everything. We're going to tear you down in a Marxist or neo-Marxist revolution and place irrational, emotional people on top. For some reason, that's not what he's saying. I haven't found it anywhere. As far as I can tell, Derrida is really actually attempting to defend the good name of the logos by saying that a true rational account wouldn't be centric, right? So the logos in the word logocentrism is not negative. It's the centrism that is negative. A true logos would be comprehensive of all legitimate approaches and understanding of the contexts and conditions under which they too become rational and participate in rationality. Derrida is defending the Logos. He's not attacking it by making it more inclusive, by making it a matter of recognizing difference. He is like the modern theologian reconciling science and religion on the grounds that both give different accounts of the same thing. Jordan Peterson does this in his Bible lectures all the time. For instance, how the serpent is portrayed as responsible for Adam and Eve's fall into knowledge and how, uh, as Jordan Peterson has suggested, this actually corresponds to the recent pending discovery that the unique evolution of our brains was actually spurred by our, by our need to avoid venomous snakes. The Bible gives a poetic spiritual depiction of what science describes more dryly and in a different way, but both reveal and conceal different things about the same subject matter. That's how he ties in with Heidegger, making both accounts essential for fully understanding the subject matter. So let, let's just pause for a moment just to make sure that we understand it. Uh, one of the points that Heidegger made um, was this notion that the reason it's very difficult to get at being, that is to get at what things really are, it's difficult to do that because objects, the raw material of their existence is so complicated and we are so limited that we can't penetrate the infinity of something's underlying being of that raw material, the infinity of that raw material. We can only get a finite look at it, and so you have to approach the same thing from multiple angles, and each angle will reveal certain things, but by virtue of that, 
will conceal certain things. So the sci a purely scientific view on the creation story will reveal certain things about it, but it'll also conceal other more human spiritual truths. Whereas the spiritual truths, if you're looking for um, scientific predictions, you're not going to find it in the Bible, <laughs> you know, uh, except in very poetic form. So the better notion is to have both interpretations in mind and to get as many of them as you can and, and compare them with each other and then see what you're looking at. So Derrida claims that logocentrism has been the attitude of Western philosophy since Plato, who was the father of what Derrida terms the metaphysics of presence. So just, just to remind ourselves, logocentrism is the notion that only one of the ways of looking at the thing is right that there is one interpretation of the object or one perspective of the object which will reveal the object in and of itself. And all of the other perspectives, while maybe they have some merit, are not as good as that one. The scientific, you know, for instance, uh, the scientific view of the creation is the most correct interpretation and that reveals what happened in itself and every other interpretation can then sort of be lined up in an order of rank away from the scientific interpretation which has now been crowned king as though the logos only were or only included or allowed for the scientific interpretation that's logocentrism that one interpretation has been made centric and everything else now revolves around it when what Derrida wants to do well I'll get into that in a moment so Derrida links with this notion of logocentrism the notion of the metaphysics of presence. The metaphysics of presence simply refers to the attitude which everyone in that dialogue that I gave had, that their interpretation was, was right and the others were less so. In other words, they regarded their, their interpretation as making the car more present to themselves, as making it more immediately real by helping their interpretation of it align better with the presumed reality of what the car is in itself. For instance, if you believe that atoms are the ultimate reality, then the atomistic interpretation will make the true nature of the car more present to your mind. You will have gotten closest to the true being as a car. But Derrida argues that a thing is more than just what presents itself to you in the moment through a particular lens, in the same way that any drawing of a cube from one angle necessarily conceals another angle from view, because we have to view things from a perspective, but things are more than just the perspective from which we view them. And that's sort of at the center of, of Heidegger and Derrida, both, and also Nietzsche. If you want to know the whole cube, you have to look at it from multiple perspectives. Each one makes some aspect of the cube more present to you, while the other aspects now become more distant or absent. Science makes it more literally present and religiously absent, for instance. But just because the religious aspect is now more absent to you doesn't make it any less real. Absence and presence are dependent on each other in the overall presentation of the object to your view. This works very nicely with Jungian typology because Jungian typology is very binary thinking. And so, but it also has the attribute of not hierarchizing or placing an order of rank on the functions of one being better than the other or more correct than the other. You have to balance them and work with other people. SE does not see the world better than NI, um, and you may see the world through your more conscious SE, but that's only because NI is helping you out in the background. But the metaphysics of presence believes that absence is tied to being less real. As this is untrue, however, the only way for someone to maintain their one perspective is to suppress all the others, usually by arguing that those are inferior or misleading. But this is not a tenable position. One can't force everybody to only regard the cube from just that one angle, especially once it becomes necessary throughout history to seek another point of view. And you can interpret the scientific revolution as an example of this, how we finally reached a point 
due to just the natural unraveling of how we deal with the world required us to start viewing the world in a different way that allowed us to move forward. Scientific revolution happened. We had to switch angles on this cube. So obviously those of you who are familiar with Marx realize that there's a lot of similarity in what I just said with Marx. And that's why Derrida sometimes associated himself with Marx. Not because he joined with one of the many Marxist ideologies, but because he saw the parallels between their notions of oppression or suppression and of necessity forcing humanity to readapt its position over many iterations. This notion that no perspective is wholly self-sufficient, that no perspective can give you the absolute most correct view of the object, that no perspective can totally render every other perspective obsolete, and that whatever is made more present to us in the object is only intelligible because there is a whole unseen side to the object that is absent. In short, this mutual dependency of every perspective on every other perspective is also part of difference, that the being or existence of things has no single correct answer, but is rather the relationship of what is currently present to us versus what is thereby made more absent to us. And because we can never view the whole picture at once, we must be content with what the Greeks called a state of aporia, or an open-minded perplexity that feels the need to keep learning, to keep what is absent in mind despite the dazzle of the present. Deconstruction is the demonstration of all these points. Derrida would take the he would take a philosophical text, one which made an assertion that such and such a perspective is most right, most present, while its opposite is less present and therefore less right. And he would then seek to show how the perspective which was made more present by the text was nevertheless dependent upon the perspective made more absent. By tugging on this thread, Derrida would cause the text to unravel. Not into oblivion, by the way, but into aporia, that is, into the recognition that both perspectives are equally necessary for understanding the world, and we can't settle on just one or the other, even though we are condemned to only view things through one perspective or other at a time. Once again, this fits so nicely in with Jungian typology and people's notion of trying to get a handle on the fact of their inferior function, or their more inferior functions, or the functions that they don't like, and recognizing that they actually are in a balance, and you've got to kind of have both, and you can't ever quite get outside of it, but it's okay, because that's just how we're built, and you can still come to a compromise between the two, but you'll always be in what in this state of aporia, this kind of uh, going back and forth between these two opposites and trying to balance them. So, in the same way, the theologian I mentioned earlier decides that both the scientific and the biblical view are necessary to get a full understanding of past events, both the literal events, regardless of human beings, and the spiritual meaning of them for human beings. So Derrida's point is not that we should just depose one perspective and then crown another one in its place so that it can have a turn at being a tyrant for a while. That's what I'm pretty sure a number of people very naively think, and it drives me nuts, but I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> um, rather, as far as I can tell, Derrida just wants to institute as much as possible a joint rule, which is part of why he frustrates everybody, because... <laughs> Because he won't, he's very, he struggled immensely with, and you'll see it in his interviews a lot, he didn't want to just come out and say things. There's there's a wonderful little video where there's this lady who's interviewing him, and um, she says, would you, would you please talk about love? And he says, he, he struggles for a bit, and he's like, I, ah, God, I don't really want to answer the question. Make it more specific. Give me something more specific I can answer. And they kind of go back and forth, and then eventually he kind of gets around to doing this whole explication of what love is, and it's sort of roundabout. But he, he says, it's very American of you, Amy. That was the interview. It's very American of you to just sort of ask me point blank, explain this thing. 
and the reason that he struggled with that is because he he had he 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 had been influenced by Heidegger and this notion that any given thing like love of all things for instance you can't just give this one definition he he could give you his statement about it he could start to expound it but that's not actually going to circumvent it but the problem is that you'll feel as though he's circumvented it when really he hasn't so he can't he literally can't just in that one go encompass the whole thing in a certain sense honestly you have to experience the thing for yourself or at least get a number of different people talking about it i don't know if i've done the best job of explaining this and and by the way, yes, I'll get to the irony that I'm trying to make a video that's like this is what Derrida is saying. Um, I'll get I'll, I'll address that. Not that I like have uh, uh, any kind of amazing answer, but I am aware of the potential irony um, in what's going on, and I'll, I'll I'll talk about that in a bit. Derrida's most famous and favorite opposition to deconstruct, as I was just saying was that between spoken word and writing. He does this several times, and it was the main theme of Of Grammatology, which is one of his most famous works. So he showed that the Western tradition has taken it for granted that writing is derived from and inferior to spoken word, because the spoken word is believed to be closer or more present with the lap of being from which language sprung. But Derrida argues that speech does not actually get you any closer to any kind of lap of being than writing does, because one still has to articulate words and form sentences which parse the raw material of reality in insufficient but partially helpful ways. The only reason we think that speech might get us closer to being in itself is because it triggers our physical senses more richly. But there is much more to reality, obviously, than just what our senses tell us. Derrida goes on to deconstruct several writers, most notably Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who believed speech is superior to writing, pointing out, Derrida, pointing out that the inherent difficulties in their position. In fact, that I prefer to write scripts, like I'm reading off now, rather than just speak off the cuff improv, is a perfect example of Derrida's point here. When I have to speak in the moment, I've found that I tend to ramble and I go on tangents and I don't formulate things as clearly as I'd like, etc. But when I write, I have time and space to think, to edit, and in my mind to get things right or get things more clear, and in my mind get closer to the lap of being, and thus I am more inclined to think that writing is closer to said lap of being. But you know what's funny is several times earlier on in, in this, and I'm literally doing it right now by the way, I've suddenly had a thought and realized, oh, I forgot something, or I didn't, I, I can explain things so much better because suddenly it clicks in my mind, and so I just go off the cuff and start improving with speech, and I'm back into speech again. And so I keep on flipping back and forth between the two. And maybe, hopefully, that that actually gets me closer, even though I more naturally tend to feel that writing is, is the better way to go, and that's what I'm more comfortable with. But when it actually comes down to it, I'll switch back and forth between the two. Anyway, the point is that neither speech nor writing is closer to the truth of language. Rather, both are manifestations of language, the overarching notion, and are through it interconnected. They are two sides of the same coin. Derrida is a modern Socrates, and so it is thus no surprise that so many people hate him, for his whole point is that they don't know nearly as much as they think that they do. He questions their right to the inheritance of certainty, saying, rather sarcastically, Oh, well, that reason you just gave must settle everything then, right now. Derrida is not a nihilist. He's just more careful before he says yes to anything. Unsurprisingly, many people have done precisely what he warns against, by the way, especially when dealing with him. They read badly. That is, they don't really read the text at all. 
They just read their pre-made interpretation of the text. They do not make any effort to overcome their personal prejudices or archetypes and then confirm whether the text really deserves said archetype to be placed over it. What is fantastic to behold is how it is precisely the people who admit to not understanding Derrida's writing who tend to hate him the most. In the words of Wes Cecil, they have no idea what he's talking about, but they know it's wrong. Isn't that a marvelous thing? They already know what Derrida is before they look at him. They don't even know they're only looking at an archetype for Derrida instead of Derrida himself, who is certainly rather less fantastic than what they've made him out to be. I don't know if I can go through this video without mentioning, mentioning Jordan Peterson, but it's like... I'll watch, it's like you'll have side by side an interview with Derrida and then Jordan Peterson talking about Derrida, and it's like day and night, and I know, you know, it's like I watch Peterson's uh, interview where he talks about Derrida, and it's like, it's like he's talking about the main character from Notes of Underground or something, and then you watch Derrida, and, and he's like, the nicest guy ever. He's just so adorable and stuff. And then you look at the comments and people are like, he is such a trickster. He's, he's tricking us all into thinking that he's this adorable little bunny, but he's going to murder us in our sleep. One of the things that's difficult, obviously, is that a lot of people seem to think that that's what Derrida had in mind, that Derrida was just sort of continually going back on himself and annihilating himself and sort of laughing the whole way like the Joker or something. And that's what I meant by the archetype. People already know that he's sort of this trickster. Don't listen to what he says otherwise. He's just going to trick you into thinking he's not a trickster. Don't question this archetype. That's how he'll get you. That's how he'll seduce you to the dark side. We already know what Derrida is. We have already earned our right to certainty on this. And that's why it's fascinating to me, is because people kind of just assume, oh, he's the Joker. And I'm like, there is no Joker. The Joker is an idea that you came up with, but you know what? You've got to check it out and and make sure whether or not he fits up, and I don't think he fits up. Now, that's what I was saying earlier, is that that's why it gets difficult, because it's like, okay, isn't that sort of just me doing a metaphysics of presence thing of saying, okay, this is what Derrida really is. But that's why I was trying to emphasize the notion that I, uh, it doesn't seem to me that Derrida ever really says that there's this notion, this nihilistic notion, that there's infinite interpretations of a text, even though that's sort of what everybody assumes he must have said, because they assume that he's a trickster, and that's what the trickster does. The Derrida recognizes that we can't get very far in life without assertion or certainty. Like, he knows that. Uh, you, like the Monty Python sketch, you're not going to get very far in life without saying the word is, but, <laughs> which is a brilliant sketch, by the way. But Derrida also believes that we're not going to end up in the best places if we don't at least take a little bit longer to pause before we use that word is. When you say such and such is such and such, just remember that that's a pretty bold statement, and inevitably you will find your description falling up short. Because, of course, nothing is perfectly like anything else. And that's fine. It's a human frailty. But it's one we should be more aware of, especially when one is making claims and interpretations concerning people. One of the best examples of this, I think, is uh, it's something that Derrida was very critical of, was the notion of intelligence quotient, or IQ. How do you measure for intelligence? Well, you design a test, and if you do well on the test, then you must have a high intelligence. But the critical assumption being overlooked here, I think, is that the makers of the test are somehow now privileged to define intelligence correctly for everybody else. That they are somehow closer to the true being of intelligence than anyone else. It's the same as someone developing a goodness quotient, GQ. I may very well make a test for that, just to make my point. If you make a goodness quotient to determine how moral of a person you are, but then you find out that it was developed by a staunch Republican, and obviously, as you go through the test, he was prevaluing the Republican platform as being the paragon of morality. 
Such a test would not therefore be a test of goodness, but really a test of republicanism. And that's Derrida's point. We all have biases, we all have platforms, even if they are just one-person platforms, and we all are tempted to evaluate everybody else only in relation to that platform, in order of rank, our own personal great chain of being, if you will, and our own ideals, posed as the God Almighty of that chain. And thus, we are labeled intelligent or unintelligent. We are evaluated into an order of rank, according to somebody else's definition, the definition of a small minority of strangers. Why do they get to decide how intelligent I am? But Derrida makes the point that they're not completely wrong. Don't forget that. They're just one side of the coin. Their evaluation simply should be recognized as one-sided and incomplete. It surreptitiously poses a dichotomy of value as though that were the only legitimate way to measure value. They, they do have a legitimate way of measuring it. The, the intelligence quotient clearly is measuring something. But Derrida was frustrated with the fact that they were treating it as though it was the only thing that you could measure legitimately. Speech is louder, and writing is mostly silent. Therefore, speech must be superior. But such an argument presupposes that volume is the only legitimate measure of superiority. Note, for instance, that the very fact IQ is measured by a test assumes that true intelligence unadulterated includes an immunity to test-taking stress. That would have to be an element of having a high IQ. To be sure, immunity to test-taking stress or other such skills could in many cases be considered a kind of intelligence, and you'd therefore be measuring that. But is it really indicative of intelligence in itself? of the being of intelligence? Have you really completely penetrated into its being? To say that one is not intelligent at all unless they can do well on a test designed by someone else and administered under restraints not attuned to the specific test taker, that is logocentrism. And to say that the word intelligence shall henceforth only be used to describe the specific traits we evaluate while all other meanings shall be suppressed in order to keep things clear for us, that's also logocentrism, the centralization of the logos for Derrida. It is the suppression of all other sides or interpretations of intelligence in favor of just one, the one you yourself most favor and accompanied by the claim that here is intelligence in and of itself. All else is an unfounded usurpation of the concept. But is someone really unintelligent only because they don't fit someone else's definition of what intelligence is? Or does there need to be a bit more charity and dialogue here before any conclusions are drawn? Is Jungian typology really worthless just because a scientist who I don't know has performed a test I didn't witness and recorded in a journal I can't afford how it does not measure up sufficiently against criteria which he decided upon as being the end-all be-all worth in psychology? Or is there perhaps something in Jungian typology which could eventually revitalize psychology and provide it with fresh blood once it begins to really understand some of its inherent inadequacies. Derda's childhood was dominated by the theme of anti-immigration, anti-Semitism, otherwise unreasonable discrimination, of inclusive groups defining him as an other and then rigging what they alleged to be fair tests for inclusion in order to rule him specifically out. He says, can I attend your school? They ask, are you a Jew? He answers, well, yes, by birth. Then no, they say, Jews cannot attend our school. Why not? Derrida asks. Because Jews are a corruptive influence. Derrida is perplexed. Who decided that that is the definition of Jews? We did, they say. Derrida is more perplexed. Well, that seems a bit circular. Wouldn't it be better to ask some Jews what the definition of Jew is? Of course not, they snap. Then they could lie and say they aren't a corruptive influence. Then we would be infested with corrupting Jews who have tricked us. It sounds like you're just confirming your own hypothesis, Derrida said morbidly. You don't trust anyone's opinion but your own, and that's a recipe for inbreeding. Well, I see, they say, 
rather put out and frustrated, and I suppose we shouldn't exclude terrorists either. We should just trust what they have to say about themselves. Well, yeah, that is some pretty murky water there. So I'm going to try to tread carefully, Derrida began, but I understand that what the terrorists have to say about themselves has plenty in it that would justify excluding them. I'm just afraid of you, in your fear, labeling some group as terrorists when that isn't actually in their text. Now Derrida's point is not that all exclusion is wrong, but rather that not all exclusion is right, and we ought to have a much, much higher standard of evidence before we feel any right to certainty about what something is or isn't, especially when we are considering letting someone partake of certain advantages or sentencing them disadvantages. Yes, some people have got to be turned away. You can't let someone covered in mud into your bridal store. You can't do that. But you know what? If someone really wants to get mud into your bridal store, if they're really smart about it, then they'll figure out how to hide the mud under something. And then they'll tear off that coat and they'll ruin your bridal store. And there's nothing you can do about it. You could exclude everybody from ever coming into your bridal store, but that kind of defeats the point of a bridal store. That, of course, that whole little argument I just did there really just leads to, okay, well then let's just let any, everyone into the bridal store. And it's like, well, that's no good. And thus we're out of poria. So, you know, the point I think is just have a little more respect for what you are effectively doing by keeping someone out. Stand before other men and their souls with fear and trembling, for you are both living souls, you're perfect mirrors of each other, and you reflect each other infinitely. To be sure, tough decisions must be made against others, but have a little more regard for the gravity of the situation. They are as deep and as dark as you, even if they're wrong. Nations dwell on their hearts, and a jealous father stands nearby with flaming sword unsheathed. Ethics, for Derrida, is not a matter of rules, per se, but of what you do when your rules have broken down, and you have nothing left but your own raw being as a human. What do you do when you effectively now have to make new rules, like Nietzsche talked about, when you have to deal with the exception? Do you even look for exceptions? Do you critique the rules and keep them well tested and healthy? Do you really listen to people? Do you stand before the infinite in them with fear and trembling? So, uh, Jacques Derrida, ladies and gentlemen.